Well, good morning and welcome to Chapel Street. It's good to be with you. If I haven't met you, my name is Sterling and I am typically uh, at our Mill Creek campus on Sunday morning. In fact, I was commenting earlier, I think it's been over two years since I've been in this room with people. Uh, I was in this room a few times with no people, uh, so it is good to be here uh, with all of you this morning. And speaking of that, I want you to, I want you to just try to take a tally in your head um, of how many times you have either heard or said something to the effect of these are uncertain times over the last two years. It's like give or take right around a million, right? Like I, I, I we at the outset of the pandemic, the word that kept being used all the time was unprecedented. Everything was unprecedented. It was unprecedented how many times we said the word unprecedented. <laughs> and and I, uh, things changed for us. Like movies that I used to watch for entertainment and enjoyment, sometimes they would have like a plot line where there would be this virus and it would create this kind of post-apocalyptic like scenario and You'd be like, wow, that's crazy, right? Now I watch that movie and I'm like taking notes. Like, okay, this is how you survive and this is what you do. And I'll, like, I'm trying to get ideas, right? We live our, our, our world, what we have experienced, it's all sort of shifted and changed. This week alone, waking up to images of tanks and missiles and war, it's reminded us again just how fragile and vulnerable all of this is. And we found ourselves once again saying these are without a doubt uncertain times. If you've been with us over the last few weeks, really since last fall, you know that we have been in a study of the Gospel of Mark together. A study that we've entitled Following Jesus as we look about what does it mean as men and women who are seeking to model our lives after the way of Jesus, his kingdom, what he's taught us about that. And as Jesus, throughout the Gospel of Mark, is preparing his disciples to do exactly that thing, as he's in different circumstances, in different situations, one of the things that he teaches them as he's laying out this kingdom vision for their lives is how it looks to live, to follow the way of Jesus in the midst of uncertainty. In fact, Jesus, as, as if you were here last week um, and you heard Lucy's testimony, she said, Jesus never promised us it would be comfortable and easy, and I think she used the phrase daisy and rainbows. In fact, he, he prepared us to expect uncertainty and, and, and then how to respond in it. This morning, we're gonna look at a text in, in Mark chapter 13, and it's a challenging one. Um, it's oftentimes referred to as the Olivet Discourse. Some of you may be familiar with it. It's recorded in, in three of the Gospels in this text, like many of the other texts that deal with Jesus' teaching as he's looking forward, as he's talking somewhat prophetically about things that are yet to come, and sometimes we interpret these and think of these as about Jesus' second coming and his end times, there's oftentimes when we look at these sorts of texts, a great deal of debate about what Jesus is trying to teach us and, and what he means by it and what, what is in front of us. And there's people who have spent far more time and energy looking at and studying who, who have been invested so much of their lives academically into processing the words of Jesus, whether it's in Mark 13 or Matthew 24 and 25 or Luke 21 and coming up with all kinds of different approaches or understandings to how we should think about these words. And I wanna just tell you this morning that that's, that's okay. That's, that's part of biblical scholarship. We can appreciate that. But for our, our time here today, I just wanna offer a bit of a uh, caveat or a disclaimer to, to what we're doing. Because first, it would be impossible in the context of, of 30 minutes or so to do an exhaustive and comprehensive study of, of these verses. And so I'm not, I'm not gonna attempt that. And secondly, I really am gonna try to focus on what Jesus, I think, makes clear. What are the things that for us as men and women and children, teenagers trying to live a life in the way of Jesus? What is it that he wants us to teach? And specifically on this point is what does it mean 
to follow Jesus in chaotic and uncertain times. And I'm not doing this sort of as uh, taking Mark, thir Mark 13 as kind of a, 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 a type of, of these sorts of things, or like a fable that we can get lessons from. I really think this is Jesus instructing his disciples along these lines. So uh, let's turn to Mark chapter 13. Before we do, let's pray together. Father, we do just thank you um, for your word. We thank you that in your goodness and grace, Lord, that you um, saw fit to inform and instruct your disciples about what it means to follow you, to live out your kingdom values and purpose, even when things are chaotic and uncertain. And Lord, with that, it resonates with us. So Holy Spirit, speak. Lord, continue to unfold a grander vision of your kingdom that we may as your church be obedient to living it out. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Mark chapter 13, we're gonna, we're gonna pick it up towards the end of the chapter in verse 24, and then we're actually gonna go back and, and process a little bit of the context and, and what precedes the words of Jesus here. This is what Jesus says to his disciples. He says, but in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heaven. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branches become tender and put out its leaves, you know that the summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near, at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But, come, but concerning that day or that hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going on a journey when he leaves home, he puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. Well, that was perfectly clear, right? I mean, can we just take a moment to acknowledge the different feel between the passage that we studied last week where this uh, scribe comes to Jesus and asks him the question, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus takes the whole Old Testament and he boils it down to two phrases and he says, love God with everything that you have and love your neighbor as yourself. And then in this passage, Jesus is he's talking prophetically. He's using all this figurative and descriptive language. And so we as the reader, sometimes we're, we're in this and we're thinking like, what, what does all of this mean? How am I to understand this? How am I to think about this? And how does it apply to my life? And if I'm if I'm honest with you, I kind of prefer last week's approach from Jesus, right? I, I, I prefer when he just says it straight. It's hard. It's hard to do. It's hard to live out, but it's clear. And sometimes we find ourselves struggling with passages like this. Notice, notice how Jesus began here in, in verse 24. He said, but in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light. So the question that immediately pops into our heads is after what days? And so I wanna go back a little bit in Mark's gospel and talk some about the context because Jesus really, this whole conversation with Jesus and his disciples, it starts with an ominous warning. This is the first thing that we see here, an ominous warning. I don't know if, if you've experienced this. I'm sure you have at one level or another, but you're really excited about something. You're really, you're anticipating some event, some opportunity in life and Maybe you're sitting with friends or coworkers or neighbors, you're telling them about what's coming up and then somebody just starts to like tell you why it's gonna be a bad experience. Have you ever, have you ever had this happen? I, my family and I a few years ago had the opportunity to go down to Disney World. 
So I was just so excited as I have three daughters, as many of you know, I, we, I've watched every Disney princess movie there is, like I've seen it all, I just, I could not wait to go experience this with my kids and would tell people, hey, this summer we're gonna get to go to Disney. And there are, you, some of you are some real Disney haters. I'm not gonna, <laughs> like people would sometimes be like, oh, it's gonna be, it is miserably hot. And uh, the crowds are overwhelming. I'm like, you are really putting a damper on, like stop, stop doing this. Like don't take this from me. Like, I want to be excited about this. Like, imagine for a moment, if you're one of Jesus' disciples, imagine the state of mind that you're operating in. Like, at this point in time, your, your messianic idea of Jesus is still largely based on the idea that he is going to institute, initiate a physical kingdom. So Jesus has come into Jerusalem. He's, he's there to overthrow the oppressors, the occupying forces of Rome. He's going to restore Israel to this national sense of security and identity. Things are once again finally going to be like they were when King David was on the throne. You're anticipating all of it. There's a tangible sense of excitement. If you go back, read Mark 11, when Jesus is paraded into Jerusalem to shouts of Hosanna. You're in the temple with Jesus, this center of where it's all gonna unfold. And then this happens. Turn to, to the beginning of the 13th chapter here. This is what Jesus says. So the, the disciples are in the temple with Jesus, beginning in verse one. And they're just leaving. It says, as they came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful building. So one of the disciples is just kind of taken in the moment, right? Just, Jesus, this is a pretty incredible place that we're in right now. Verse two, and Jesus said to him, do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Like that takes a pretty negative turn pretty quickly. Like the disciples, they're, they're, they're having a moment here with Jesus. They're, they're looking at all that is in front of them. They're exciting, anticipating, planning. And as they look at just the, the spectacular architecture, the grandeur of the temple, as they're taking all of it in and they're admiring it, Jesus says, there isn't going to be one stone left on top of another. So when your vision for what is in front of you, when your vision of what is ahead of you is the physical restoration of Israel, and in your heart and mind, the temple is central, not only to this place of worship where you as a people meet with Yahweh, but really to your identity, Jesus' words have to be both confusing, right? How is this even possible? Is, is Jesus using the temple as some type of metaphor, like he does that sometimes, you know, but also deflating. It also has to be deflating. How can I reconcile these words with my assumptions and beliefs about how Jesus is going to launch his kingdom? Like imagine for a moment <clears throat> that you just bought a house. The papers are signed, the deal is done, your family's all packed up, you're getting ready to move in, and as you're standing in your front lawn just kind of admiring your new house, someone that you love and respect, somebody that you admire, somebody that you believe and trust, walks up next to you and says, man, this, this whole house is gonna be leveled in, in just a short time. How would you respond to that? What, what would be going through your hearts and your minds? Like once the shock wears off, I think reasonably you would, you would have a few questions that you wanted to ask. And the disciples are no different. Back in verse three now. They've left the temple. It says in verse three, as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple. So they've, just, they've got this view overlooking this incredible structure. Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all of these things are about to be accomplished? So in, in other words, when they hear Jesus say this, the, their natural reaction like ours is when? When is this gonna unfold? And then how, 
how do we know? What are the indicators? How should we be prepared? What should we be looking for? Your expectations have been drastically altered and probably painfully so. And so you reasonably want to know a few details. Historically speaking, in 66 AD, the Roman uh, um, general Titus sieged Jerusalem. By 70 AD, uh, Jerusalem had more or less been burned to the ground and every stone on the temple was taken down. In fact, you can still walk through the Western Wall. I brought a picture of, this is a modern picture of Jerusalem. These, these stones, some of which are the size of like a small car, remain where they were left thousands of years ago when, when Jerusalem fell. So Christians have looked at the words of Jesus here and they, they've asked themselves the question is, is, are we supposed to understand this all in the, the rearview mirror? Is this all regarding events that have already took place? Was 66 AD to 70 AD the fulfillment of what Jesus is talking about? Or is Jesus also preparing us for something that's yet to come? Is there multiple perspectives that he's unfolding here? Is there 70 AD, but then is there a future event like in verse 24, when he talks about the, the coming of the Son of Man, what, what does Jesus want us to understand? Or is it somehow a combination of, of both? What unfolds next is, is, I think, equally surprising to the disciples because they ask the question, when is this going to happen and how will we know the time is here? And Jesus starts to answer those questions. So the Jesus describes for them a climate of chaos. He describes a climate of chaos. Again, we're still answering that, that first question in verse 24, where he says, but in those days, well, what days? What days are we talking about here? What is Jesus referring to? He goes on in verse five now. He says this. And Jesus began to say to them, see that no one leads you astray. And one, one of the things I want us to pay attention throughout this text is listen to the imperatives that Jesus gives the disciple because I think they are informative for us. See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name saying, I am he. And they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there'll be earthquakes in various places and there will be famines. These are but the beginning of birth pains. Be on your guard, there's another imperative. For they will be delivered, for they will deliver you over to councils and you will be beaten in synagogues and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death, and father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. But at this point, I'm, I'm imagining that the disciples are sorry they asked. When, when that's the answer that you hear from Jesus. I was listening to um, another pastor. He was actually preaching on the Matthew 24 passage and he was, it was, in, he was delivering the sermon in January of 2016. And his opening illustration as he was preaching on a similar passage to this was talking about looking back at, at 2015 and how turbulent that year had been and how many difficult things that, that they had experienced and all the ways that there could have been moments in 2015 that were felt like the very things that, that were described here in Mark chapter 13. And I'm listening to this from the perspective of 2022 right? I'm thinking 2015, like 2015 was a cakewalk. Like I don't even remember anything about, about 2015. Like 
We, we live in a time when, when we're looking at what's unfolding around us and we think, what is going on here? And here's my, my point. There are different interpretive views that, that scholars have regarding this text and how we are to understand it. Is this strictly referring to what is leading up to 70 AD? It's, it's at least that, correct? Is it also uh, indicative of a season yet to come preceding what we talk about as the second coming of Christ when Jesus is going to return and he's gonna set up his kingdom in full? And people have looked at, at the events that have unfolded over the last couple of years and we've wondered, you've wondered, I've wondered at times, is this, is this happening? Are we... Are we seeing the indicators? Is this, are we in this moment that Jesus is referring to? And I think fairly so, we've asked those questions. Or is what Jesus describes here both specific to a, a set of circumstances that they will experience it, but is also a picture of a world broken by sin? Is it a picture of the human condition when we, when we fail to surrender ourselves to the way of Jesus on large scale? Is this the storyline of humanity left to its own devices that has been unfolding all the way from Genesis chapter three? Now alongside of God's redemptive storyline that is actively being written in the work that Jesus is going to accomplish? Or is again, some mix of all of the above? My, my inclination is to kind of land in that, that fourth option. I think it's, it's some of all of that. But you and I, we tend to read these verses with our, our modern Western eyes, which makes sense. That's the world that we live in. And our experience in large part, if we're honest with ourselves, it has been somewhat insulated. Even though over the last few years, we are situation, our circumstances, maybe has felt more indicative of some of the things that we read and hear in Mark chapter 13. But for most of the church, throughout most of history, the words of Jesus felt far more descriptive to their own lives, to what they were experiencing. It was much more in line with their reality. I think this is part of the reason that throughout church history, there has been a sincere conviction among Christians, among believers, that they are living in the end times, that they're living in the moment, the season that Jesus is describing here. And so far, up to this point, they've all been wrong. It's interesting to note, if you ever read uh, Tom Holland's book, Dominion, um, who it's, it's just an interesting perspective because he's an agnostic looking at church history and its influence on society and the world and, and, but not necessarily sharing the convictions. It's, it's really a, a fascinating perspective. But one of the things that he takes note of in that book is how frequently believers lived in this conviction that within their lifespan, within their generation, Jesus would return and that he would restore his kingdom. It's actually been a trait that has been consistent over the last 2,000 years. And of course, we could cite all kinds of unhealthy examples of situations where people have made specific predictions about days and moments and times when all of this is going to unfold and, and made rash decisions, uh, chosen not to, to plant their crops because they were convinced that Jesus would return. And then ultimately had to declare bankruptcy and lose everything when it didn't unfold that way. We know the stories of the dangers of, of getting this wrong. But in the end here, Jesus is, is directing, he's guiding, he's leading his disciples. He's saying, I want you to be prepared to understand how to live in the midst of, of chaos, of uncertainty. And so look again then at these verses that we started with. I wanna pick up the conversation that, that we began with, given that context that we've talked about. This is back in 24. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. And the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And they will see, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. 
And then he will send out his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heaven. And then Jesus gives us two metaphors here. He says, from the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his own work. And the command puts his servants in charge, each with their own work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, they stay awake. For you do not know when the master of the house will come in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. We know we experience the reality of, of the consequences of failing to pay attention, right? We, we experience that in our lives. I've experienced that a number of ways. I remember one time when, when Sherry and I were young marrieds and she had made this chocolate cake for a family birthday party and we had a, a, a puppy at the time, a Weimaraner, if you know what kind of breed that is, do not, do not get a Weimaraner. Uh, they're great dogs, but this dog was too smart for its own good, and she was very food driven. So Sherry made this cake. I was upstairs working, and she had to leave. And she said, "Hey, I'm. I left this cake down on the kitchen counter. You got to make sure that the doors stay closed." And I sort of was like a little kind of like offended by her direction. Like I'm not stupid, and turns out I am stupid. Um, <laughs> Like the phone rang, I went down to answer the phone, I got absent-minded, and the dog, again, she's, she's so smart. She didn't do anything where I was in the proximity of like being able to stop her. She waited till I went back upstairs to get started on my project, and I come and that cake is like half gone, like just eaten. And the consequences of that were severe in a number of ways. <laughs> Jesus is, his word in the midst of all of this to his disciples, to the church, is stay awake. In this last two sections, Jesus he gives these metaphors of what this looks like, these pictures. He describes what it means to stay awake. If we were to almost take all the imperatives that we've talked about, if we were to sum that up in Mark chapter 13, and one sort of phrase, it would be those last words of Jesus to stay awake. And note, by the way, that he also mentions here that no one knows when this is going to happen. So I think it's fair to say that, that we can stop guessing about that. But then he gives us, he says, there's the lesson, first there's the lesson of the fig tree here. And once again, there is, there's debate about how we're to understand this metaphor. And, but I think if we just boil it down to its essence, the, the point that Jesus wants his disciples to understand is pay attention to the season. Right, there's, there's indicators that will tell us that summer is near. But as I've mentioned earlier, the, the church has lived almost its entirety of its history in the belief that summer is near, which I think is perhaps the point that Jesus teaches us in the midst of chaos, in the midst of our cultural moment, that we are to live as his followers with our eyes wide open. We're to be people who are attentive and ready, paying attention to what's going on in our world and responding in view of, in accordance with his kingdom. Jesus says there's, there's a lesson in the fig tree. And then there's a second metaphor. It's the parable of the doorkeeper. The parable of the doorkeeper. So what do we do in the meantime? What do we do as, as we remain alert and ready? We go about our father's business. We do the things that he has put us here to do all along. We all know what it's like, right, to work with somebody who only works when the boss is looking, right? 
I don't know what that's like. I, I, everybody I work with is wonderful, but you know what that's like. <laughs> this is what Jesus is getting after here. Jesus' imperative to his followers as we wait for his return is to continue to do, to do the work that he has gifted and equipped you to do. I don't know if Jesus is gonna return today. I don't know if it'll be tomorrow. I don't know if it'll be in a thousand years from now or a million years from now. But what Jesus has left us with and what he has made abundantly clear to his disciples is until that day comes, we are to be about his business, about his work, which he has just told us, is about loving God with everything that he has, every, every part of us, and loving our neighbors as ourselves. We've been left here right now with a job to do, to represent and to advance his kingdom. And Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, don't fall asleep on the job. In the midst of, of the chaos, in midst of uncertainty, in midst of turmoil and pain and grief, and we watch it unfold. And we watch it relatively from a safe distance. Jesus says, remain on purpose, remain on mission. He says in verse 37, as he wraps all this up, he says, what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. Stay awake, church. That's, that's what Jesus instructs us to do in the midst of uncertainty and chaos. Would you pray with me? Father, we do just thank you for... Um, for your word. And Lord, we certainly look at a passage like this and there's questions that we have and we wrestle with. And yet there's also things that you make perfectly clear. And so Jesus, as we try to navigate the events and the circumstances around our world, Lord, we recognize even now, Lord, we pray for the church in Eastern Europe and Ukraine. Lord, we pray for the church in Russia. Jesus, would you raise up your followers to speak words of peace and to Defend, brother and sister, Lord, would you intervene and move there? Lord, in the midst of our own uncertainty, in the midst of our own circumstances, would you remind us that you have put us here for a purpose, for a mission, and that is to advance your kingdom, and may we do it effectively, and we ask all these things in your name. Amen.